Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the W.J. Alexander Lecture in English Literature. My name is Markus Stock, and I'm the principal of University College and a professor of German and Medieval Studies here at U of T. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'd like to ask you, all of you here in the room and online, uh, to take a moment to reflect on the indigenous histories of the land upon which you live and work from wherever you're situated while you're viewing this presentation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the W.J. Alexander Lecture. This lecture series was created to honor William John Alexander, a professor of English at University College for 37 years from 1889 to 1926. He was regarded as a great teacher and his lectures were very popular throughout uh, U of T among students from all fields. Following his retirement, the lectureship was established by Professor Alexander's former students and colleagues. He attended every lecture series from 1928 until his death in 1944. The series continues to thrive thanks to the generous support of the Alexander Lectures Fund, the University College Alumni Association and bequests from the Jean Stewart Coop and Helen S. Stewart Estates, which have enabled 95 years of stimulating contribution to the intellectual life of Toronto. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Hortense Spillers deliver the Alexander Lecture this year. Dr. Spillers is the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor and Distinguished Research Professor Emerita at Vanderbilt University. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Now the Work of Criticism. Some quick housekeeping notes. This lecture is being live recorded. For those attending in person, a microphone will be passed around during the Q&A portion after today's lecture. Please raise your hand and once the moderator calls on you, please wait for the microphone to ask a question. I'm sure you'll be very eager to enter the discussion, but please wait for and speak into the microphone in order for our remote audiences at home to be able to hear your question. For those attending virtually, live closed captioning is available for this event. The option can be turned on by clicking the closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please, if you're joining remotely, use the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions, which will be monitored here and brought to the live moderator's attention. I would now like to call upon my colleague, Michael Cobb, Professor of English, to more formally introduce our distinguished speaker. <laughs> Literally don't need to be applauded for walking up, up to the podium. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, Aries, is Aries season, my season's ending and Taurus season is beginning. So it's kind of wonderful to kind of welcome you all here. Um, thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you, Alexander Lecture. Uh, thank you all of you for coming and all of the staff, really kind of impressive group of staff here working today. So thank you for making this a smooth event so far. Um, few of life's pleasures are so direct, so pure as the one I have today. I'm privileged to introduce my dissertation chair, my lifelong mentor, my eternal friend, Hortense Spillers. Sure, I can do the usual thing of letting you know that she's the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor, comma, Distinguished Research Professor Emerita at Vanderbilt University, a post she held for 17 years after a career teaching at Cornell University, Haverford College, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Wellesley College. Over 50 exquisite years of impressive teaching. Um, I can remind you of her, of, of her formidable collection of iconic essays, Black, White, and in Color, Essays in American Literature and Culture, which is required reading. Um, uh, I can celebrate her recent induction into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I can also assure you that by delivering this prestigious lecture today, she has now, I think, delivered all the most renowned named endowed lectures at every major research institution in North America, and I will not list them all. Uh, there's too many. 
uh, relate to the party. In no uncertain terms, uh, Black, feminist, gender, queer, trans, and American literary and cultural studies have been fundamentally, foundationally shaped by Hortense Spiller's work. Uh, Foucault, if he'd known her, did you know Foucault? Okay, I don't know. Uh, if he'd known her, uh, uh, <laughs> would have described her as an initiator of discursive practice. Uh, but Professor Jackie Goldsby of Yale University put it more elegantly. Hortense, she declared to me one sunny afternoon outside of Cornell's Olin Library, is quite simply primary text. Those are some hits, uh, but let me deepen those highlights with a couple of vignettes showcasing Spiller's grasp, her genius, her generosity. So Vanderbilt last year celebrated her career by inviting some of the most important scholars in her fields of study to say goodbye to her years of teaching at Nashville. It was two glorious spring days of people, are, people honoring the debts of Spiller's scholarship. Riley Snorton, Farah Jasmine Griffin, Jasmine Griffin, Sharon Holland, Margot Crawford, Thaddeus Davis, Ro Robert O'Mealy, E. Patrick Johnson, Dana Nelson, among many others, worked so enthusiastically to communicate Spiller's influence. It reminded me of the first time I watched scholars gather to thank her. That was way back in 1999 at the University of Pennsylvania when Michael Awkward and C.D.R. Hartman organized the first Spiller Symposium. And this has been kind of a frequent event. There's been many. Uh, like them, I watched the most impressive people strain to express the depth of their admiration, their feelings, their thoughts. The climax during the last panel was when Deborah McDowell just burst into song. A singing rendition of Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, You've Really Got a Hold on Me. The entire audience loudly, joyously joined in. Um, just a side note, the only other time I've had so many academics yelling and belting out songs was with uh, Jose, Munoz and Jose Munoz in a uh, post-MLA karaoke bar with a lot of drunk uh, queer theorists. So not pretty, but, but whatever. This actually did happen at this academic event. I have video of it if you want to see it. If you don't believe me, come find me in the reception afterwards if you want to see it. It's very charming. Uh, McDowell's, McDowell leading us in song felt especially apt conjuring up in my mind passages from Spiller's crucial essay on race and psychoanalysis, All the Things You Could Be Right Now If Sigmund Freud's Wife Was Your Mother. It's a, the title is a reference and homage to Charles Mingus's song of the same name. In that essay, Spiller's argues that the, quote, long buried articulations on the interior levels of culture are necessary registers from where Black culture finds some of its most potent critiques. The situated quality of any speaker is so loaded with what Spillers elsewhere calls mythical prepossession that they have to do a dizzying, the dizzyingly complex work of understanding the social, legal, and cultural realms in relation to one's own idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic reaction to those dynamics, however unconscious, unsystematic, unknowable those reactions may be. For Spillers, intelligibility, representation, being seen is never adequate enough. When you're making a critique, in part because the technologies of visibility, ontology, and epistemology at hand captivate and capture. They shut down the dynamism of one's engagement with any life world, especially life worlds marked by the arbitrariness of despised differences. A number of canny ways each of those celebrants at Spiller's retirement event were communicating how they had taken on the depths of the intellectual ethical complexity that Spiller com Spiller's compares to demanding, often dissonant music. We don't know how to hear just yet. Listen to Spiller's own lyricism as she explains what I'm glossing. Okay. I'm getting really... This is, uh, Hor this is Hortense. Um, I have chosen to call this strategy the interior intersubjectivity, which I would in turn designate as the locus at which self-interrogation takes place. It is not an arrival, but a departure, not a goal, but a process, and it conduces toward neither an answer nor a cure, because it is not engendered in formulae and prescriptions. More precisely, it operates, uh, its operations are torque-like to the extent that they throw certainty and dogma, the static, passive, monumental aim into doubt. This process situates a content to work on a discipline as an ascesis. And I would specify it on the interior because it is found in economy, but it is not exhausted by it. Persistently motivated in, inward, in inwardness, in flux, it is the mine of social production that arises in part from interacting with others, yet it bears the imprint of a particularity. 
in the rotations of certainty, this mine gets away with very little scot-free. And that, I believe, rebounds back upon the ethical wish that commences this writing. My interest in this ethical self-knowing wants to unhook the psychoanalytic hermeneutic from its rigorous curative framework and try to recover free-floating realm of self-didactic possibility that might decentralize and disperse the knowing one. We might need help here, for sure, but the uncertainty of where we'd, been, we'd be headed virtually makes no guarantee of that. Out here, the only music they are playing is Mingus's, or much like it, and I should think that would take a great long time to learn how to hear it well. In other words, the work is very hard and elusive and never obvious. Torque, time, and patience, and relentless complexities that need to be provisional, adaptable, and rigorously nuanced are features of the kind of critique Spillers asks of her readers. Um, and again, you know, firsthand, those were these, certainly the demands that Spillers made of me as I wrote my dissertation on James Baldwin, William Faulkner, Paul Marshall, and Flannery O'Connor under her precise supervision. Speaking of that dissertation, back in 2001, again, I was five, at a restaurant in Ithaca, New York, on the night of my dissertation defense, Hortense took me and the rest of my doctoral committee out to dinner to celebrate. She bought a lovely bottle of champagne and made me a resolute teetotaler. I do not drink, but she made me drink to the finishing of my first big piece of writing. I literally was not permitted to resist, uh, and I always resist. She then announced to the table that, one, that what one longed for as a teacher were students who would be one day smarter than you, who would take the old questions and make them new, more vibrant, better formulated. Of course, it is patently absurd to think I could fulfill that wish. No one could if Hortense were their supervisor. But it was wonderful to think that that's what pedagogy was all about, that teaching, thinking, and writing were about departure, not arrival, about the conversation continuing rather than resting on some dusty laurels in the academy. That there are generations to teach, and you teach alongside the wish uh, that the students and the future could be otherwise, that they could be smarter and much better than you that there's always important criticism yet to be written, and that that work is communal. I stole her philosophy right there and then, and have unashamedly made it my own. I might even have included that in my promotion materials, who knows, um, maybe with a footnote. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could say I felt guilty about taking so much from Hortense over the past 26 years, over long dinners at restaurants and conferences all over the world, but those gifts were offered, and one might as well make one's life, and hopefully a few other lives, that much better. And for that and so much more, I'm grateful. Indeed, Hortense, to quote, not sing, Deborah McDowell and Smokey Robinson, seems like I'm always thinking of you. I love you madly. Uh, you've really got a hold on me. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Hortense Spiller to the University of Toronto so she can deliver today's Alexander Lecture, now the work of criticism. Oh my goodness. I wish Michael could give the lecture. <laughs> oh, he could have, I could have listened to that for a while longer. I so appreciate it, Michael. Thank you so much. It was really lovely. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming. This lecture almost didn't happen today. I was thinking I was going to have to um, put it off. Air Canada lost my bag the other night. It was the bag with the talk in it. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, it sounds like an excuse, but it really isn't. The bag was actually, the talk was actually in that bag. And there's only one of these copies because I do everything by hand at first, and then I put it in a computer later. Because I, you know, I like to have, I like to be fresh when I say things to people. And so the computer and the talk were in the bag that was lost until yesterday afternoon. So they finally got it to me, uh, but they took it to the uh, corporate headquarters of the Four Seasons Hotel rather than the Four Seasons. So I thought, what's wrong with the Canadians? 
they're so much smarter than Americans. Why are they getting this messed up? You know, you lose the bag and then you take it to the wrong place. Anyway, it's lovely to see you on a, on a beautiful day that I did not expect to be a day of snow flurries and, and, and 40 degrees. Um, I also want to thank Principal uh, Marcus Stock for extending this invitation uh, to me to come to Toronto, one of my favorite cities. So it, it's nice to be back. We have heard long before now about death of the traditional humanities more generally speaking and the particular demise of literary criticism against its backdrop. But the elegiac strains of loss and decline have only intensified in the urgent context of so much else that disturbs our sleep. And the refrain will be a familiar one. Among them, threats to sustainable life on the planet. The wounds inflicted on democratic ideals that have resulted in the worrisome curtailment of liberatory possibilities across the globe. As this development has unleashed especially harsh regimes of repression and prohibition in US society. We could extend this repertoire of complaints that provide common ground across the fault lines of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, nation state, geopolitical nicety and nuance, but suffice it to say that all our inquiry of the moment seems battered by a context that is rife with crises. Perhaps we might want to dispose of a nagging doubt that says something like, when was there ever not a crisis? Or by what criteria do we decide that some kind of peace has been disrupted? If such questions cannot be tamed from our vantage, then I want to draw on a few of their implications and ramifications for inhabitants of the academy, for those who make their bread shuttling between what some people like to call the real world and what some others refer to as the realm of imagination, where acts of creative work unfold the only problem there is that this neat dichotomy exists only on paper, perhaps in our prayers, where the deal actually goes down, one lives a sort of tweed of experience, in which case there is a poltergeist under my dining room table knocking, knocking. For example, in my country, they are banning books as thoughtfulness has acquired the malicious moniker woke, whatever that's supposed to mean. And I'm trying to figure this out as a particular problem that I won't necessarily talk about today, but it's in the background of my thinking quite a lot. Wars customarily have rules, but if the spaces where citizens live define the precincts of the non-combatant, now invaded by neighbors, cohabitants, friends, family members, and other familiars armed with AR-15s, a right supposedly protected by the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Am I now a military target? Would the International Red Cross or Amnesty International 
ever describe American deaths by mass murder as the violation of various Geneva Conventions of Peace that came about on the globe in the aftermath of World War II. However, we might respond to these questions, some of which are not rhetorical. The fact remains that I am, alongside millions of other Americans, now engaged, unbitten, unwanted, in loosely defined warfare as an unarmed, unsuspecting military combatant. In other words, at any time, in any place, from the supermarket to the university campus and the classroom of primary and elementary schools to the church, the synagogue, the mosque, my life could be claimed at any moment in the terrifying statistical count unrivaled by any other society for this kind of crime on the face of the earth. And my question, not necessarily for uh, this talk, but my question generally is, what is the name for this? As we live in an era where, as Kenneth Burke said, just so many decades ago, there are situations for which we need a name. And we have many of them. That's one of them. Nearly a century ago, the Frankfurt School dared to imagine a critic and a criticism of multiple purposes. And it seems to me that we've reached that point again, the critic of everything, as a reviewer of John Guillory's professing criticism put it, the critic of everything takes as his, her object of critique, the society at large, so that nothing socially relevant falls outside the pale of their critical scrutiny. An example is proffered, I believe, by the Black Studies Protocol, whose itineraries cross their wires with historiographies, archival studies, philosophical and psychoanalytic inquiries, anthropological projects, music, and the fine arts. This trend line roughly defines what we recognize today as cultural studies, whose bureaucratic home now is located in the quote, English department as a cluster of curricular and disciplinary objects. It could only have happened in the post seventies world that an English professor might share a cooperative arrangement with the law school or a PhD in medical research hold a joint appointment in the law school and the medical school simultaneously. I know somebody like that, actually. So this catholicity of position and intent that mixes and shakes up apples and oranges could only have occurred in disciplinary transformations that characterize the academy after 1968 and the emergence of race gender and sexuality studies. But this critic of everything emerges in uncertain, often hostile conditions, but in any case, it is an intriguing concatenation of disparate provenances. In the sketch of Don Guillory's account of the history of literary criticism, he observes in the opening pages of this collection of essays that literary study became a profession before it became a discipline. And as a discipline, he argues, it was finally baptized in the periods after World War II in the name of literary criticism. 
literary criticism in producing discourse about literature apparently combines the 19th century critics work with the newly emergent professions of the late 19th century and then only fully after the First World War. The 19th century critic, not dependent on academic credentials as his latter-day avatar would be, achieved great visibility and influence in what Guillory calls the periodical public sphere. When literary study later sought to identify itself as literary criticism, which was the claim of jurisdiction over literature, it fused the 19th century identity of the critic <clears throat> with the professional identity of the 20th century scholar. The new methods, which would be powerfully consolidated in the new criticism and the practices of close reading, would substitute interpretation for judgment, thus redefining the progression or the profession, rather, of criticism as a discipline. Might this not be an instance of professional deformation is the name that uh, Guillory borrows uh, from, from the French. And this professional deformation or the emergence of specialization to my mind sounds like it is the clearing away of detritus and the sharp focus on a single object of scrutiny, perhaps an example of M.H. Abrams heterocosm, wherein objects behave according to uh, rules that belong to an alternative reality or rules that belong only to them. We can all name great works that leave a huge footprint at the apex of this movement, Norfolk Fry of Toronto, certainly among them. But if what Guillory describes here is the exact contrary of the critic of everything, the 1960s would open the way to the disruption of what Guillory calls the post war settlement, which left or which lifts criticism above mere opinion or the work of judgment by specifying the verbal work of art as criticism's proper disciplinary object. The 60s revolution would shape or would change everything. It was the equivalent of what James Baldwin described somewhere in his writing as heavenly bodies moving out of place. Guillory describes this juncture as a convergence between an externality, the new social movements of the later 1960s, and an internality, the assimilation of continental theory into literature departments beginning with comparative literature. And we can almost date some of this precisely. I'm thinking of the year 1966, and I'm sure people might be wondering, well, what the hell happened in 1966 that was so great? Remember the structuralist controversy? Um, I was just out of um, undergraduate school a couple of years before, and I don't think, I'm not sure I had heard about structuralism before. 1966. Now it all seems like, how could you never have ever not known what structuralism was? But I'm remembering the structuralist controversy of 1966, which introduced names like uh, Jacques Lacan to an American public. And that seminar that had all those figures in it, uh, Lucian Goldman, uh, 
Jacques Derrida. I mean, a whole table, of, very long table of content became the, the, many of the names that would dominate uh, the new epistemologies in American uh, institutions. So that 1966 work that really grew out of a seminar became a model for the School of Criticism and Theory that opened its doors for the first time in the United States in 1974, that grew out of 1966. Uh, I was uh, a member of the first class of criticism and theory. Of course, I'm 100 years old, so I did all those things, right? I say I'm 100 so I can stop counting and so people can stop asking. I'm 100. So they look at me at the airport when I say that, like. <laughs> so 1966, and of course, I don't have to talk about 1968 because it, it's as if uh, something happened uh, on the globe in, in 1968. So it looks like 1966 and 1968 married each other and they kind of hooked up for what might seem uh, related movements and in some ways um, they are related but in some other ways they are, they're really very disparate things that happened on the globe. So the, the, the chief result of this convergence that Guillory talks about as an externality, uh, the world impinging on the academy in, in 1968 and North American academies absorbing the continental movement uh, around that same time, the chief result was a reassertion of the critical motive in its strongest predisciplinary form. This reassertion, Guillory contends, entailed an about face insofar as the proper object of criticism was no longer the unilateral focus on literature. In fact, literature came to be regarded as the constraining scope of critical assertion. The proper object was now its mission as the criticism of society. And that's what looks like the Frankfurt School that's actually quite a lot older, right? Several decades older. So these movements as familiar as they are, are worth evoking because they precisely mark the stakes that right-wing resentment and revanchism would extirpate as though they never occurred. Black movement, which conduces to Black studies. Women's movement, which leads to women's studies, expanded to gender and sexuality studies. The Stonewall Uprising, which puts sexual orientation on the table, as well as Eve Sedgwick's epistemology of the closet, which all combined would reconfigure curricular objects in the human sciences as unheard of disciplinary projects a short generation before. And no small target of right-wing rage and hatred in today's monstrous era of backlash and entrenchment. These new movements, Guillory argues, provided literary study with specifically political aims, but not the means <clears throat> of their expression in the public sphere. <clears throat> I think I'd better get a drink of water if you don't mind. Okay. So the discipline became the object of criticism. The discipline and its structures, especially 
the curriculum were reimagined as surrogates for the social totality. The canon debates of the 1980s and 1990s, but also the coming about topicality or the foregrounding of political thematics in teaching and scholarship, along with claims for the socially transformative effects of these thematics. Topicality in reorienting uh, teaching and scholarship to the politically relevant seems to me precisely where we are currently located with our hands somewhat tied by what Guillory describes as a check on the aims of topicality given their mediation through the university itself. As a result, the current crisis of legitimation, the collapse of the job market for PhDs, funding reductions, declining numbers of majors in the fields of literary and critical studies, and then the crisis that Guillory says is internal to these fields, justification. How do we justify the work of criticism? Or more precisely, what are the means for assessing literary studies' real effects in the world? I have a very short answer for that, which I'll, well, maybe I'll tell you what that is. I don't always say it too kindly to people who ask that question. How do you all justify yourselves? Um, Guillory says that what we're doing today uh, in the absence of the ability to affect such measures, we are reduced to justification by faith. My sense of the crisis of justification that Guillory addresses is that it is both true, in fact, it is even a truism at the same time that it is incomplete. In other words, the proof or the test of what we do might well be at this moment the embrace of the critic and the work of criticism as the task to address society. And I cannot think of many people who were better equipped to address the society, the world that we actually live in than people like yourselves, people in this very room and people like you. Because you're smarter than most of the other folks we know, right? To me, I mean, that's a chauvinistic statement, but that is kind of what I think. So to my mind, uh, one of those urgencies is the teaching of literacy. And I'm not just talking about the ABCs, but maybe I'm also talking about the ABCs, right? And I think we have as a profession not done that. And when I talk about literacy, I mean the profound literacy of culture and history. And one of the reasons why this so-called, the so-called woke doctrines uh, permeating the United States can succeed is that somewhere along the line, uh, the academy stopped being concerned about literacy, the state of the language and people's relationship to uh, the language. A couple of years ago in an introductory course to the major, which I uh, taught in uh, the Vanderbilt English department, I attempted to instruct students in modes of critical inquiry, music, film, the novel, two pieces of nonfiction, uh, including uh, a reading assignment of the Constitution of the United States. So from one point of view, this course in its contravention of the gospel of specialization was an outrage. Given that I am not a film or music critic, 
nor an historian, nor a political scientist. So what the hell was I doing with my hands on the constitution? But I went right on in there. I went right straight to it and pursued this transdisciplinary design from the point of view of what Virginia Woolf called decades ago, the common reader. In other words, I took up these topics outside my field with assistance from a few colleagues in those disciplines with an eye towards showing what the study of a novel, and in this case, the novel we read was Henry James's Portrait of a Lady, what that looked like in perspective with other creative acts, box, cello suites, John Coltrane's Love Supreme, Beyonce's video of that year, not Renaissance, but the one before that, that came out a couple of years ago, who's I'm having one of those moments. What is it? Yes, exactly. All the president's men and the US constitution. So I took up the constitution as an effort to teach citizenship, because to my mind, this is not just something that a political scientist would teach or historian would teach. I mean, why can't a literary critic read the constitution of the country of her birth? So I, I took that up as problems in democracy because I decided that that might be the one and only time that some people in that class might actually read the Constitution of, of the United States. So I wanted to do what I could do to increase awareness in my young interlocutors that human expressiveness crosses a spectrum and that much of it will strike our eyesight, our entire sensory and sensual repertoire, not as objects that we will encounter or meet as experts or even regard with special competence, but rather as a problem in contemplation. We ask questions if our brains have not been killed off by our politicians. We ask questions about the cello suite, the saxophone performance, how movies seduce us, how we all become three-year-olds once we enter a movie and just start going, oh, look at her, and start talking back to the film. I mean, that really is okay to talk back to the film, I decided. But it's a part of, it's a part of our learning. So in short, these different curricular objects raise curiosity, which inscribes the first steps toward critical investigation. That may well be one of the principal tasks of the critic of everything in a classroom, to lead students to confront objects in space outside themselves. And I want to close on a note because this, to my mind, um, raises a question that uh, Guillory is very much taking up uh, in, his, uh, in his recent work. If we are not specialists, what are we? And I'm saying that uh, we may well be specialists, but we also have other work to do and so far as I am concerned right now, uh, the most important work we are doing is trying to preserve what life is left on this planet and trying to save uh, the North American continent for the continuing experimentation in democracy. As far as I'm concerned, that's our work right now. That's our urgent and immediate work right now. And we take that up uh, as, as, as best we can. I want to talk in closing uh, about um, what I would call the moment of Black studies. 
And the moment of Black studies is instructive in this way. It is the moment at which a street movement was transformed into a curricular object. I was a graduate student at uh, Brandeis University, the winter of academic year 1968-69. In fact, that was my first year uh, in, in graduate school at, uh, at Brandeis. And the second semester of that year, uh, the Black Students Association, mostly made up of undergraduate students, but there were some graduate students uh, who were members, and I was a graduate student who was a member, took over a building on Brandeis campus called Ford Hall. Ford Hall used to be the computer center at uh, Brandeis University. We took over Ford Hall for 11 days. And it was a very kind of scary experience because the threat of violence was always there. We were made to understand that the uh, Massachusetts National Guard would have been very happy to have come in that building and started busting heads. But the faculty of Brandeis University, to its great credit, and it is an act I honor to this day, took the decision that they were not going to call the police force on members of their student body, even though we were not in effect their children. We were some other people's children. But they took a vote that day that said they will in fact be our children today because we don't like that they've taken our building. In fact, we're kind of pissed off about that. We don't like that one bit. And put some professors out of their offices. But we won't do that. Brandeis University created uh, by Jewish community in, in the United States was probably in 1968, about 20 years old. So it was the product of the Second World War, created after uh, the Second World War and the Holocaust. So I suppose out of that community, there were a lot of people with the kind of historical memory that they did not betray when it was important to remember it. Right. So out of that experience, uh, a Black Studies program was created. 11 days later, we, we, we came out. So it seems to me that this street momentum, a street movement, and it was happening all over the world, it seemed, at that moment, something happened with, uh, with the women's movement. And Stonewall Uprising, all of, all of those movements that we associate with uh, the raw political act met their moment and had to transform themselves into another name or to keep the memory or preserve the memory of itself as a street motion or a street movement at the same time that it took up the tasks of scholarship. I cannot think of more movements that are more intriguing and more worthy of study than those movements that hit the academy in the world after 1968. So you've got this synergistic meeting place or convergence between polar opposites, the epistemological and the political or what happens out in the world. And to my mind, this difference is never resolved. We seem to want to resolve it. I'm not sure it will ever be resolved. I'm not sure that um, we should want it resolved. 
But I think of it analogously with the Du Boisian double consciousness, which I in turn have concluded offers a version of ambivalence. And ambivalence may be regarded, so far as I am concerned, as a resource. We can think of it as riding or trying to straddle two runaway horses moving in different directions. And the point is not to be thrown. The point is to ride them both. And the question is, well, how do you do that? That's the paradox, right? I mean, that's kind of what you learn how to do. I mean, you learn to straddle an opposition and that's where the idea of ambivalence comes in. So it is the tension that we feel between epistemological urgency and political necessity. And we are involved in both. The tension is the nervous energy that is relayed between our scholarship and its material, historical, and political context. It is the dance between tradition and innovation, between comfortable installation and exilic sense or exilic consciousness. And what I mean by that is we don't come to the university to get all comfortable. We come to be pricked and disturbed and to maintain that. So that we are always, it seems to me, in the university, if not of it. So aspirationally, the disciplines post-Black studies are always in the moment of its impure arrival. And I think we can never get away from that. It is coming from this world, trying to transcend this world. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions or Yeah, I can, I can to the table. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Okay. Q&A. Wonderful. Great. Well, Michael, maybe I will stay here. You can stay there. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll sit over here or I'll stand over there. Okay. I'll stand over here. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have time for questions. Uh, and you, sir. Oh, and wait for the camera, uh, the camera <laughs> microphone <laughs> coming to you. Thank you, Professor Stillers. Um, Spillers. Um, that was incredible. Um, I, I'm just struck by the tension that you're talking about at the end. And it reminds me a little bit of Bayard Rustin's From Protest to Politics. Um, because in addition to the Epistemological, epistemological versus um, material or political tension. It seems that there's also a tension between the almost generalist responsibility that we have to each other and our exilic, perhaps also part, uh, part of how we learn about that responsibility, uh, sense of being outside. Um, and so I'm wondering, because you've crystallized that tension so clearly, if you have any strategies that you can um, suggest for teachers, professors, and also students um, that materially can enable others to either ride both of those or to find ways of navigating them. Thank you for that. Um, that person is online and not Sorry. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. I was looking for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps I'll help you stand up next. <laughs> How to um, strategies. Yeah. I wish I had um, some, some, some foolproof ideas about this, but my, um, my sense of things is that um, Nobody beats us with the pen. Uh, nobody beats us um, with the microphone. Nobody beats us 
imagining relationships and that that kind of thing and so i would i would like to see i think i would just like to see more humanities people doing battle uh with the world that is drunk and arrogant that needs um a head doctor a preacher and and all priest all 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 the rest of it so that what i have done practically uh as as a citizen is start uh, a little online journal called the a line a journal for progressive thought uh we are, we are behind um with the, with 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 the next issue but i but i should think that uh a lot of what um what people are doing now participating in uh demonstrations i was i was very pleased that uh one of my current students um they stripped me of parking privileges at vanderbilt but i can sit on dissertation committees <laughs> and one of one one of the people whose committee I'm I'm sitting on uh, is writing a dissertation in education and in literary criticism and in, in in the work that we do. But then he's also participating in demonstrations at the state capitol because Nashville is the capital of the state of uh, of Tennessee. That did the very dumb thing the other day of expelling uh, the two black uh, Congress people because they participated uh, in the um, demonstrations, and so I, I was I'm I'm very pleased uh, to know that that student is participating. And and actually, if I were uh, if I didn't have to worry about being arrested, I might be out there with the demonstrators myself now. So I think what we have to do is all the things that we know uh, work. Protest works, speaking works, writing works. And we have to, I think we have to do what we do really well. And we don't need to apologize about that or justify or explain to anybody about what we do. We don't live in an ivory tower. We live in the world. Right, and we do it pretty damn well, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we're not out there shooting people down with guns or pulling switchblades on people, or you know, we're not doing any of that. So it seems to me that the arts of peace and the skills of literacy are um, the wealth that we bring to uh, the current scene, and I, I think we should use them. That's what I like to see more on other questions yeah back there hi dr spillers hello my name is whitney garrett walker i'm faculty do i have to use this just for the online audience okay. i know it's hi online humans <laughs> um, my name is Whitney Garrett Walker. I'm faculty at University of Toronto, OISE. Um, I'm a professor of educational leadership policy and social diversity from California. It's my second year in Toronto. I want you to know that because you know I love you. Um, the first thing I want to do as an elder and literary giant in the field of Black feminism and beyond, I want to say thank you. It's not often that we are able to be able to sit at the feet of our elders, and I'll say for myself, and I'm so honored. I have had chills the whole time sitting with some of my favorite books that I bought in my purse. <laughs> yeah. um, so my question is about pedagogy. You talked very, uh, very briefly, even though you write a great deal about it. Um, you said lead students to confront objects outside of themselves. And I think um, we could link that to a lot of different things, um, not just in Black feminism, Frarian um, ways of being, so many different things um, in the humanities, social sciences of critical work I'm referring to, including your own. What other ways do you see us pedagogically um, transforming the way we deliver it to graduate students. Um, 
so that we don't just stay stuck in this tower. I think for me, I come from a background of being a public school educator of over a decade. Mm -hmm. And so I'm coming in from doing the work. And so my question to you, since you've done the same for many years, mm -hmm. what do you think is next for folks of my generation? And speaking of pedagogy as an act of activism as well. Yeah. Well, I have a feeling that you are probably already doing good things in your classroom, right? So that, um, you know, I think, I think probably what, what needs to happen is a kind of um, reaffirmation of certain critical ways of uh, dealing with students. I think we have given up on the idea of challenging students to be their be their best selves, right? I mean, I think that, well, I'm thinking about how teaching evaluations have probably altered the landscape of teaching. I mean, it's made everybody too grade conscious. It's made the students grade conscious uh, in ways that um, I don't think are particularly good for them to dwell on. And this sort of intimidates teachers a little bit because everybody wants to be popular. Uh, nobody wants to be a stick in the mud, a thought to be a bad teacher. Or not. Uh, people want to avoid that. And so what I'm thinking is that unless you introduce a certain kind of context to uh, course evaluations, if they, if they take place outside that, that context, and for the most part, they have been introduced outside uh, a context, they're just forms and are handed uh, to, to people, they should, they should take place in a conversation, in a dialogue about the purpose of uh, your, your being here. And if that doesn't happen, then we are not, I don't think we are encouraging a dialogue at all and, and, and we are actually participating in the corruption of academic life. And one of the things that's problematic about academic life is that, you know, we're, we're, we're forever looking at ratings, the best schools in the world, you know, and that's, that's a kind of Miss America renamed, who is the most beautiful woman in the world. Who the hell wants to know who the most beautiful woman in the world is? I mean, isn't it enough to just know beautiful women? <laughs> <laughs> or beautiful men? I mean, what the hell is this? The most, be most beautiful on earth is, that's just, it's corrupt and corrupting. And we have been exposed to the corruptible and the whole rage for ratings. That's, that's, that, that's been a part of our ruin, of our wreck and ruin. I mean, Fox News, in order to keep up its ratings, and I'm sure you've heard about the 787 point million dollars, I wish they would have to pay out much more. I wish they would pay out enough to have to go under. I can't think of anything much more hateful than the Rupert Murdoch project. How can you take that as a project? And here's a man in his 90s, and it's like, how much longer is this guy going to be here? You know, and how can you, how can, the, a project to poison the well of the world's democracies? What is that about? So you keep up, so in order to keep up your ratings, you have to lie to people? I mean, you feed people fantasies? You feed them what they, what they want to hear and not what, not what the truth is? So I think I'm saying um, the classroom 
is one of those places where I'm thinking a certain integrity has to be restored. I mean, in other words, it would be a good thing if we felt confident enough to talk to students like they were adults and not babies, right? I mean, if you said to young people, these are skills that um, I'm, I'm trying to help you practice, you're here to uh, do good things with your life. Let's not ruin it. Let's, you know, let's 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 have a good time. Let's let's learn some things, and it's that's not gonna always be easy, or we will not always be in love with each other. But I think that's, and I think we're failing. I think we're failing to do that. So I would say that a lot of what I think we need to do, or what. Uh, what I thought when I left the classroom we needed to do was restore a sense of urgency and immediacy uh, to uh, to the people that that that, uh, that we're teaching. I think we have an online question. Connor, do you want to read it out loud? Sorry, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Um, I've uh, got a question. Um, uh, is Black studies coming from this world, trying to transcend this world, akin to using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house? If so, what are the possibilities for Black studies? Is there a way to transcend? Well, I always think that uh, the master's tools are perfect to use. As a matter of fact, they are the best ones to use because what happens is that uh, when you use those tools, they become not just masters, they become something else. That's what I used to tell um, students at uh, Brandeis and maybe one or two other places I've taught. There were at times certain black students who felt guilty about being in the academy and who would ask that very question and they would say things like well you know i can't um i don't feel comfortable on the old block anymore and what am i and what am i doing here and what i would say is get up out of that corner stop sucking your thumb and get on with it who said you shouldn't be here you have as much right to be here as anybody else and the test of whether or not you belong here is the fact that you are now do something with it make it matter that you are here because i i i truly believe that practicing the uh professions practicing the disciplines and practicing them from the perspective that you're bringing to it changes the discipline. I mean, we're not just adding content. I mean, it seems to me that we, we're really shifting the object of inquiry, right? I mean, you, you're shifting something. You're not just adding something to something. You're, actually, you're changing the question. You're changing the disciplines. That's what I believe has happened over the last 50 years, that those, those disciplines are not what they were when I went to graduate school in, in 1968. They, they, they're, some, they're, they're somewhere else now. And so that's my answer to uh, using, uh, using the master's tools. I mean, in... in well, I guess you could say that uh, theoretically speaking, there's there's always the master and there's always the slave uh, or the enslaved. Uh, where people live, it's not that easy, right? I mean, where we where we live, uh, those those theories 
get uh, get shaken up. So that's what I'm that's what I'm saying about uh, the master's tools. I've never much believed in the master's tools. You show me a toolbox, I get interested in it. Oh, what's in there? Oh yeah, this is yeah, that looks pretty good. I think I can use that. I'm a t a, a a tinker thinker, a thinker tinker. Show me the box. What you got? What you bringing? You the smartest person in the room? Well, let's see. <laughs> let's look at that. So I don't worry about no master's tools. <laughs> You can bring him in here. I'm talk to him. Yeah, what you got going on, buddy? <laughs> you, you're back. Thank you, Dr. Spillers. That was wonderful. Um, I have a question about uh, writing, which is something that's bringing a lot of bodies into the English classroom. Um, how do you see creative writing in English departments as contributing to the role of criticism? Um, and are there strategies that we should be thinking about either to break down barriers between creativity and criticism? Um, or to combine those two in classroom context? Well, you know, I'm wondering if um, if we're over-specialized in the world. Um, I have been uh, a teacher of, of, of creative writing. I've actually written two or three little stories. And... I actually have a novel in the world that's... And I'm going to find one day. <laughs> and you're going to find a novel <laughs> <laughs> that I've been working on a while, right? So I'm thinking that um, in this world of, of, of over-specialization, we have probably segregated ourselves from the creative writers and the creative writers uh, from, from those of us who are... Uh, call ourselves critics. So I think probably those barriers are arbitrary and that maybe they should be tested and, and, and broken so that uh, creative writers, um, who's to say that a creative writer can't teach uh, philosophy, a philosophy course? or a philosopher creative writing. I mean, I think we probably need to really look at ways in which the bureaucratization of what we do necessitates certain policy choices. I'm beginning to think that that's, uh, that's happening now more than we realize. Uh, for instance, I have a, I have a fellowship in in the fall uh, that I'm that I'm going to take at, at Dartmouth College, and um, I was asked to submit a course description, and I submitted the course description, and you know I've always taken pride in my course descriptions. I. I <laughs> I thought that this this was a pretty good course description. So the word came back that, well, they need a checkbox of many more things. And so it's about five pages of things that the course description wants me to add to the course description. And I thought, now, who in the world would do that? <laughs> who would think that up you've got the course rationale you've got the course requirements you've got a note on method you've got your primary texts you've got a calendar of the readings you've tell you've told people where they can reach you when they can reach you the email telephone number what what are you talking about you want something else that's, <laughs> how could that be? So I'm thinking, okay, you know what that is? That's the, that's, that's the bureaucracy speaking. They don't really need that. But you've got to justify the work that you're doing as an administrator 
and this is what you do. This is the this is the person that you send the course descriptions to. And so they they believe me, they don't need that. And so I'm thinking that um, specialization works in tandem with bureaucratization. And that bureaucracies become more and more elaborate so that they take what is innovative in what somebody is doing and make it standard operating procedure so that everybody now has to do it. And that's what, that's what bureaucracies do. And that's why I think we dislike them. I think that's why we dislike forums so much and, and people who do that kind of work so much. And I think this division between, to get back to your question, creative writing and the rest of us probably has to do with, with, with bureaucracy more than it has to do with intellectual work in their brain and in their hearts about what, should, what needs to be done. I think, that's, I think that's where it's coming from. And whenever that happens, I think it needs to be, it needs to be met with, um, with resistance. I'm not sure it's especially good to have schools of creative writing. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's such a hot idea. I think there ought to be a way to find talent, but schools are nah, not, not sure. <laughs> so I think I, I agree with the, the impulse behind your, your question, yeah, I think it's probably too much of that specialization. You had a hand back there? Um, first, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so I was wondering, you said earlier, uh, we don't come to university to be comfortable. We come to be pricked and disturbed and sustain that, which I thought was brilliant. And But you also mentioned earlier that you were afraid oftentimes when you go out into public uh, of death from hate crimes or gun violence. And um, and I think a lot of us might be feeling similarly. So I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between what seems to be something like a productive discomfort and an unproductive or destructive discomfort. Mm, yes, that's, that's really good. And I, I, I wonder, um, I wonder about that myself. Um, And I, I, I think of it this way. Um, I always I always check with myself in the sense that uh, no matter how depressed I might think I, I, I want to be or discouraged I feel about uh, the political scene, uh, I always um, I always check with myself in the sense that I know not to take myself too seriously, not to get too serious about uh, whatever it is. So I think as long as you can maintain a sense of humor, that's coming out of the good place, right? And I think that's what's going to keep you from getting um, inappropriately afraid, I think is what I, I, I would say. That it, it, it comes from, I think, trying to stay on good terms with yourself and keeping up... Um, keeping up humor about yourself. There are times when I actually tickle myself about different things. And it's, you know, I think it's, 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 it's all right to, uh, to laugh about that and make sure you have plenty of good people around you who, who, who keep you healthy. People like Michael Cobb. Right? <laughs> And be sure and drink plenty good red wine. 
yeah. <laughs> but yeah, knowing the difference between those those things, and I'm not I'm not sure, I'm not absolutely sure that that you can you can always know. But I think if you if you rely on your your instincts and your sense of humor to help you gauge how you're feeling about, about things. And this, the, the, the sense of, of actual danger really comes out of, um, really comes out of history, right? A sense of the historical. Uh, I was born uh, in, in the state of Tennessee, in, in Memphis, Tennessee. For a number of years, uh, I didn't live in the state. I, I lived uh, in a number of other places. And then about 2006, I thought, well, maybe it's time to get on back home because my mother had entered her 90s. And I was thinking, well, okay, well, I went, you know, I went back to, I went back to the state. But uh, now that uh, I've lost my mother and siblings, I'm beginning to listen to that knocking poltergeist that I talked about earlier in the talk, the knocking that's saying, hmm, are we now going back to that moment when uh, I entered consciousness in the South? I saw apartheid in the United States end. I saw the official end of apartheid in the United States when I was something like 12 or 14 years old. And to now come full circle in my life to see the neo-Confederacy reassert itself. I mean, that, well, it almost, it almost takes your breath away. Uh, it, can, it can really depress you. But I say to myself, well, you know, you, you have too much history that you know about and that you know Black Americans have been through than to be discouraged about this, but you have to, you have to keep your eyes wide open, right? And so it's, it's, it's my, my historical sense, my sense of humor, those things I try to put into, into action to keep me sort of, um, on the straight and narrow, as it were, on the good, on the good foot, those things, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I think the sense of humor is a testament to the fact that I'm speaking now. I didn't expect to do that, but I feel very comfortable right now. Thank you very much. I'll good for you. later. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about a lot of what was said by you and the other question askers. And uh, I was wondering what the, like, um, so outside of the academy, say that you have graduated and you don't have institutional access anymore. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of like in that space of like, okay, if I respond to these people online, like these old people and like, you know, use his like, uh, evidence to you know it's a I don't recommend doing that but um just like that sort of creating something when you're out of that system I guess is like kind of confusing I was wondering if you had any thoughts of like you know stealing the master's tools that's okay. actually a little harder nowadays because EFT has implemented two-factor authorization so <laughs> I don't because say what was the last part of it uh, uh uh, there's just two-factor authorization before you can access like literary resources in the library. And stuff. Oh, so, like, I see. And so just, you're saying you don't have access to those things anymore because you're not in the institution? Yes. So it's like one foot in, one foot out. It's like, what do you do when you know something and you want to correct something out there, but you just, you're not able to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I will, I don't know, I, this is probably not so much an answer uh, to, your, to your question, but 
maybe we can think about your question against this backdrop. One of the things that has surprised me a little bit is that there has not been more resistance to social media, for instance, from the people who know it most, and that is people of your generation and younger people. I've been, I've been very surprised at that. Uh, it really is true uh, that my generation is is the the television generation, and maybe the end of radio and the beginning of of of, of TV. Uh, T TV. Your generation is the generation of of streaming, right? So that means to me that the revolution about the streaming industries is going to come from, from young people. And that's where I would think that um, the threat of artificial intelligence, how the hell can you threaten? That's not gonna happen, <laughs> right? With millions of, of, of smart young people, so why haven't there been, there may well be, and I just simply don't know. Why hasn't there been more resistance to the internet and to, to those uh, online sources? So that when somebody has an authentic reason to need to use those resources, they can they can do so. I'm waiting for the revolution. That's what I'm saying. For young people to have a revolution, and they're having it about guns, which is terrific. And I think they will finally make politicians do something about guns. Uh, there is a revolution. Either it's coming or it's sporadic um, about the, the the abortion ban in the United States. That's that's coming. So I'm so I'm waiting when when are people going to get in the street about Elon Musk? I'm waiting on that. And I'm waiting for people to say about artificial intelligence. Look, let's have an intelligent discussion about artificial intelligence. Replacing human what human beings are just going to sit down and let themselves be replaced by the machines they made? doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm, I'm waiting for people to take fewer selfies and <laughs> to get on the ball with this fight, this fighting back. I'm, I, want, I want to hear some good critiques about technology, which I know absolutely nothing about. Whenever I need to do something techno technological, I'll get in touch with Michael or Rich or say, help me with this thing here. They'll tell me what. To do. So I'm I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the real. That that's the real revolution. I mean, we certainly are threatened by this very passive, unnoisy thing that's there, right? So I, you know, I want to know um, when is liberation coming, and and people are going to say, "Oh, hey, come on, enough. Let's let's have a conversation about this," which would in turn open up access to what has become uh, pretty exclusive in in its uses, right? I mean, it's a very exclusive resource. It's a dominant, world dominant resource. And I, and I think it's, I think it's time for the people who have these revolutions all the time, young people, to fight back in the ways that they more than anybody else would know how to do. Yeah. Thank you. 
anything else? Should we? We should probably. We should probably wind down. But one more question. Is that is that your? Thank you so much. I, I don't think I, I need it. Thank you so much for um, for this. I am completely honored to be here. My name is Pablo Herrera. I'm from UTSC Scarborough, well, UTSC. Um, and um, I, I think thinking about what you're saying about, you know, expecting a revolution from, from the youth. Mm -hmm. I also feel, and this is something I tell my son, that he's being trained to not rebel. Right? And I think the part of the issue here is that maybe the revolution won't come because they're being trained to just take this media and streaming as part of something that's their own. Mm -hmm. So then it brings me back to the position that you talked about attention or working tandem between, between this issue of politics and, and epistemological work that yeah. is on the, yeah. to say it's on the shoulders, not only of the instructor and the teacher, but also the students who come to university classrooms, right? Yeah. So I'd like to, it'd be great to hear you talk a bit more about that that tension, this politics and epistemological practices that we, we need to yeah. carry forward. So yeah, yeah. We sort of plant the seed for something to happen. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. How to do that? Um, I think it goes back to um, it goes back to the classroom in the sense that I think the, 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 the I don't know, the professoriate, um, I wonder if, if, if the professoriate always feels um, the urgency to remember um, the the different histories, the constituencies in the universities. I mean, if you look at, at, at the universities today, a lot of the population that's on the campuses today were not there 50, 60 years ago, right? And so that means that uh, there's been a radical change but people people tend to forget i'm 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 thinking i heard somebody say once once black people started going to ivy league institutions the question was well what do, what happens if uh, some of those black people become gatekeepers and you know they they keeping other black people out they, they they're denying tenure to others like themselves um and so that's that that's a very real thing somebody said i heard somebody say once about a colleague of ours you know that person acts like he was born at yale <laughs> Act like his mama went to Yale and Harvard and Princeton and stuff. I think people have to um how do you compel people to remember? You can't do it. But I think remembering uh what what this has all meant is a part of that 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 process of respecting history and honoring uh the historical circumstance so that um when i'm on on campuses these days um i look in gratitude at the landscape because it's so unlike uh what it was in 1968 i mean there there were no um Nobody in the English department at Brandeis in, in, in 1968. So that when I wrote a dissertation on the rhetoric of black sermons, um, I had to write it with a Jewish professor who thought it was a very interesting topic. I mean, he thought that uh, C.L. Franklin's sermons were as interesting as John Donne's. <laughs> so I'm... This is a plea for people uh, not, not to forget, 
where we've been historically. And I think in, in not forgetting, I think you convey that sense to uh, the people that you that you teach. I mean, you teach them, you teach them respect for the historical as well. And if people are taught to respect the historical, you know, it it's it's teaching people to sleep with one eye open, right? That you never really sleep. I mean, it's always a kind of <laughs> keeping an eye out. And if that's the case, then I think, yeah, people have to get less comfortable, I think, with the direction that we're going in because it's a lot of, uh, I just wonder every day how uh, in, in, in my country, we are so comfortable. And, you know, we're going about our lives like everything is fine and it, 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 it's not. Not a day passes that somebody does not get shot in my country. And it is, it's humiliating to me. It's scary to me. The last three days, people have gotten shot because somebody made a mistake. It happened this morning. And this is cross-racial, any age, any part of the country, although I must say it does happen in the neo-Confederacy quite a lot. Four young cheerleaders, one of the cheerleaders got in the wrong car. The man got out of his car and shot the people. What is that? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of nuttiness that we're going through that I don't understand why, how we can be so comfortable in our, in our everyday world. It, 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 it's not business as usual. Something has happened. Something in the fabric of the social order has ripped and it is killing us quite literally. So the question is, what do you do with that? And that's what I think more of us have to come to understand that something, we have to do something about this. We can't just go on living as if it's just, ugh. it isn't, it isn't. Something is very, is very different. So that's what, that's what I mean about, uh, about being, about being disturbed. Um, yeah, I, I think we should, party hard and, and, and really enjoy it. And then when it's time to work and to think about work that we, we need to do that too. We need to confront what we, what we have to confront. So on with the revolution, <laughs> tell your son. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so very much. Um, so you gave us, you showed us your toolbox. Yes. But <laughs> you not only showed us your toolbox, you also shared your tools. And that's really an amazing gift that you brought to, to our institution. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, so this concludes tonight's lecture. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, uh, for your wonderful questions. Uh, really a very special Q&A. Uh, also the, uh, the, the audience uh, online for their questions. Um, the biggest thanks, of course, to Horton Spillers uh, for bringing us your thought-provoking uh, talk uh, and questions. Um, Michael Cobb for the wonderful introduction and moderating. Um, <laughs> Connor Bennett for your um, uh, the the moderating of the online portion uh, of the Q and A, uh, Molly Rosen for their AV support, Lily Lampras in the principal's office, Mahisha Ramasar, Marsha Markham, and Sarah Franco and the team 
uh, of the University College Advancement Office. Uh, you see them uh, around here. Uh, they made all of this possible. Uh, our own University College chef, Mike, uh, for providing food later on uh, in, in the reception. Um, uh, and of course, you all, audience uh, members, uh, for attending, uh, for being engaged and for providing your questions. This is the last uh, endowed lecture of this academic year. Um, we will start out again in September uh, with the priestly lectures, which have been postponed from this term. Um, Glenn Coulthard, professor in First Nations and Indigenous Studies from the University of UBC, uh, September 19 to 21st. I mean, we don't want to think about that, I know, right? But I, I wanted to plug it in no matter what so that you can get it into your calendars right away. If, if you're so inclined uh, to put th something in your calendar in September, that's the one thing that you should put in there. Self-reliance and, and as self-determination, third world influences on fourth world anti-colonialism uh, is the title of this talks. I encourage you to attend and, uh, attend and I hope to see you there. But now, Please join us right next door for our reception, at least those of you who are here or those of you who are online and very close by. Um, the, the reception is next door in the senior common room here. Uh, and then uh, all of you take care. Have a great evening. If I don't see you before your summer starts, have a great summer. It's been a really eventful year here at the college and, and on campus. Um, and uh, we all deserve uh, a really nice break, and I hope you'll all have a really nice break. So thank you again for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.